Hello, this is Joe Reinhardt, and this demo is from Train Signal. Another important aspect to understand in IP routing is, are the terms classful and classless. We want to take a little bit of a look at this because it actually impinges on how routing protocols operate. We want to take a quick review of the IP address classes, what classful routing involves, how classless routing works, and then this is really the point of this, when classless protocols act in a classful manner because it can impact what your routing tables look like. To begin with, let's do a quick review of the different IP address classes. And this is IP version 4. We can talk about IP version 6 later in a separate lesson. But originally the Internet Protocol standard specified five different address types, A, B, C, D, and E. Class E was considered and labeled as experimental. It was really never used, and it's far beyond the scope of anything you and I are probably going to have to discuss. You can see the table to the left lists leading bits, octet range, network bits, and host bits, and those sorts of things. But Class E is largely irrelevant. Class D specifies address space for multicast operations. And just a moment ago, we talked about unicast, broadcast, and multicast. It's as a subject, multicast is beyond the scope of what we'll be discussing in IP routing, but it does have functionality that's important that we'll talk about later. Classes A, B, and C, however, are very commonly referred to and identified very broad groupings of IP addresses that had similar characteristics. In this particular case, certain number of bits in the host portion of the address and a certain number of bits in the network portion of the address. Now, the whole A, B, and C class was deprecated in favor of CIDR or classless interdomain routing. It had a lot to do with being able to conserve addresses because there were small organizations, small in terms of uh, addresses, that received these very large class A blocks and essentially large amounts of them would end up being wasted or not used. And so one of the ways to be able to control the explosion of the IP routing tables was to be able to change from this class hierarchy to something a lot more scalable. Sometimes this class A, B, and C is also referred to as major network numbers or major network boundaries. And this becomes important later when we talk about things like auto summarization. But class A, B, and C, pretty straightforward and likely something you already ran into on the CCNA. Classful IP routing could actually be referred to as class-based IP routing, which just basically meant an IP address was pretty much inseparably bound to the class to which it belonged. A class A address would always be a class A address, could be a class B address, and couldn't be treated as anything other than a class A address. What I mean by that is the network and host portions of the address were considered fixed. So 8 bits in the network portion for class A, 16 in a class B, and 24 in a class C, and then the converse, 24 bits in the host for class A, 16 for a class B, and 8 for a class C. It assumed as part of this that if you were doing subnetting, you were using the same network mask for everything. So you might use a slash 24, but you have to use it for every part of the network as you're carving up the address space. You can't use a slash 24 in one spot and a slash 30 in another and a slash 25 in another spot. And part of this is because the classful routing protocols did not transmit subnet mask information in routing updates. So it just had to assume everything was the same. And this led to something called static length subnet masking or fixed length subnet masking. SLSM is what it's sometimes referred to. And because of that, discontiguous addressing was a problem. If you had a 10 dot address network on one side, a 10 dot network address on the other, and in between you had a 17216 address in the middle, you would have problems with that because essentially the network is being split up by this foreign network in the middle. And so that's sometimes referred to as discontiguous addressing, and it wasn't supported in the whole classless world. So because of that, and because of the explosion of the routing tables on the internet, something had to be changed. And classful routing became classless routing. Classless routing pretty much threw away the whole class A, B, and C mentality and changed it to sometimes what's referred to as CIDR or classless interdomain routing. It was prefix-based routing. 
In other words, you would take a prefix, you would take whatever the prefix is, say how many bits were a part of the subnet mask, and then you would transmit that. And because of that, you could subnet, meaning carve up an address space. You could supernet, which means being able to summarize a larger address space. For instance, if you had so many class C addresses, you could actually aggregate those together in a prefix that really doesn't belong in a class C address because you're aggregating. Because all the network information devices care about now is what's the prefix or network and what's the mask. Because of that, routing updates included the subnet mask, so then devices would know what kind of addressing it was really dealing with, how big the prefix was, how long it was, what was involved with it. And this is sometimes referred to as VLSM, or variable length subnet masking. Now you could use a variety of masks in the network, and it really didn't matter. You might use a slash 30 for a simple point-to-point -point link. You might use a slash 24 for a LAN. You might use a slash 28 for a WAN connection, but the point is at the end of the day, the routing protocols knew what that meant. Because of that, there was support for discontinuous addressing, and for instance, an internet service provider could send out one or two announcements with this large number of addresses aggregated down to a simple statement or two instead of having to send this very large number of routing updates with things that are more specific. So classless routing. Since most modern routing protocols use classless addressing, and classful addressing is this ancient relic of the past, why should any network engineer care about classful routing at all? Glad you asked that question. There are specific occasions when classless routing protocols act in a classful manner. For instance, if you wanted to just for grins, you could go into a Cisco router and put in no IP classless and it would immediately make all the routing, pro routing protocols act in a classful manner, back to the A, B, and C hierarchy. But that's largely a lab exercise. More specifically, and to the point, some protocols use something called automatic summarization and summarizes networks to the nearest classful boundary. In essence, acting in a classful manner, even though it's a classless protocol. The bad news is it's frequently enabled by default, this auto-summarization. EIGRP, RIP, and BGP will just do the classful summarization by default. It's disabled by issuing the no auto-summary command in the routing protocol configuration mode. But knowing that in advance when you're putting a network together or you're looking on the exam or whatever the case might be, knowing that if you don't disable auto-summarization, your classless routing protocol is going to ask in a classful manner. So keep that in mind when you deal with these various protocols and the quote unquote features that come with them. Thanks for watching. For more information regarding our training, please visit www.trainsignal.com.